Welcome to the CWTA uh, webinar on uh, the SBA financing for exports, uh, along with a little introduction to the new uh, second version of the uh, Paycheck Protection Plan that was put through recently by Congress and signed into law by the president. Uh, let me tell you that the Carolina World Trade Association was founded in 1964 as a chapter of the North Carolina World Trade Association, which promotes the growth of trade between North Carolina and the world by providing education and networking opportunities for our global ecosystem. As a business-driven nonprofit organization, CWTA's mission is to promote, foster, and encourage international commerce success and expanding economic growth in the Carolinas region. We do this by advocating the interests of businesses engaged in international trade on the local, regional, state, and federal levels. Uh, we also do this by educating businesses and their employees to the resources, issues, policies, and practices within inter international trade. And we also promote regional assets and opportunities for expanding inbound and outbound international commerce. And last but not least, uh, we celebrate the successes of international trade uh, for, by recognizing businesses within our region. Uh, just to give you a little uh, housekeeping instruction here before we get started, uh, I wanna give special thanks to our sponsors. They include Bank of America, Greer Walker, Wells Fargo, Garfinkel Immigration, North Carolina Ports, Domtar, and k &L Gates. You should know that your microphone will be muted during the presentation. If you have a question at any time, we'd like you to use the chat box, which is found in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you should know that uh, we will be sending a copy of the presentation to each participant following the webinar. And you should also know that this presentation will be recorded and sent out to the CWTA mailing list uh, following the meeting today. Uh, in order to get that, you want to make sure you have signed on to receive our emails on the CWTA website, which is www.cwta.org. And we thank you very much for participating today. I'd like you to meet our speaker here. We. Uh, had several on several occasions tried to hold this event earlier, uh, even before Christmas. Um, but uh, we were confounded by uh, government holidays, and then our speaker happened to contract uh, bronchitis, which, which also turned into a slight case of COVID. Uh, but he's recovered, thank goodness, and we're happy to have him here. Um, our speaker's name is Dan Holt, and Dan Holt is an international finance specialist with the U.S. Small Business Administration. Dan was born and spent his early life in Wilmington, North Carolina. He received his BA degree from the Citadel in Charleston. After serving as an officer in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Europe, Dan returned to civilian life and managed a, re a major retail operation. After a second stint in the military, Dan became employed in financial services and banking. Dan joined the SBA in the early 1980s as part of the disaster farm loan servicing operation. Dan was promoted to commercial loan division and became the senior lender for the North Carolina district office. In the late 1990s, SBA realized the need for small business to have access to capital to compete in the global markets. And Dan was their man to, to, to uh, invite businesses to participate in that. Dan was selected for the position of international finance specialist for North and South Carolina, and has worked for the past several years as a partner with US Foreign Commercial Service and the Exim Bank to expand the potential for small business uh, in the Carolinas. I would like very much to, uh, I'm gonna make sure we, for some reason we keep getting Karen on there. I'd like uh, Dan to open up with his presentation. Meet Dan Holt. Dan, it's all yours. Good morning or good afternoon as the case may be. 
Uh, this presentation is a mixed bag. It is not geared specifically for bankers or for clients uh, because uh, there's an increased need for y'all to know about the Paycheck Payroll Protection Program and the disaster loan programs that are in operation right now. Uh, so you can encourage your customers to take advantage of them. The, uh, we, this is the second round, but getting the word out and getting the correct word out has been very difficult. They don't let us get billboards yet. At the same time, I have a vested interest in getting banks interested and customers in the export programs. Because from my viewpoint and what I've seen of, uh, from The Economist, sometime in this year, in 2021, after we get the couple hundred thousand or a couple million, tens of millions of people vaccinated, business is going to not return to normal for, perhaps, but it's going to open up. We have new administration, we have new blood. There's going to be an urge, I hope, to get to return to normalcy. I hope we have the pictures like after World War II of people dancing in Times Square. Uh, so that's what we're aiming at, and we want to be prepared to meet the needs. Now, what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about the Export Working Capital Program, which is my flagship, Export Express, International Trade Loan, but we're also going to talk about payroll protection and economic disaster. Uh, both all of these are things that are running right now and banks can participate. And I think we'll start off with the paycheck protection because that's the one that's on everybody's mind. If you're a client and you're listening in, this is the one you're interested in. Okay, the basis of the paycheck protection program is one, it's a bank driven program. This is not a direct loan from the SBA. We expect over 4,000 banks to participate. Some will be online banks. Many of the, many of the lenders, and just for a background for the customer, is SBA is actually paying banks to process these loans for us. We don't have the manpower. The total SBA, the permanent number of permanent employees right now is about less than 2,000. And we've got 8 million loans. Go figure. Uh, how many could we do? So we've uh, gotten banks in, we're paying the banks directly to process the loan because they, the, they have the facilities, they have the money, and all they need is a little incentive like payment. Now, from the last time we did this, the first time was a little harder for the simple reason we had 10 days to put the program together. And putting together a multi-billion dollar program uh, in 10 days for anybody is hard. It's the equivalent of building the Bank of America, uh, and there's no building there. We had to build it from scratch. So this time out, almost all the lenders that are participating have experience, and almost everybody has figured out that online portal is the way to go. And we expect to see very little paper. Matter of fact, most of the bankers I'm talking to will not accept a paper application because they can't make any money. Gee, if you're having to move paper that many touches, uh, basically eats up the profit. So uh, ex anybody's a client, expect to see everything online. And what you, uh, if you, what you can do is I always recommend that you dance with who brought you. If you've got a, your business account with the local bank, that's where you need to go. Uh, if the bank does not participate, I recommend uh, just checking to Google. If you Google uh, PPP small lenders, you'll come up with hundreds of small non-bank lenders. Some of them, the only thing they do is they're making these loans. Last time out, and I'm not sure about this time, PayPal was doing it. I'm not sure if they're gonna participate. But in many cases, all these small banks have online portals you apply online. And that's a very good deal. Uh, also, something that everybody needs to understand, you expect change. The first PPP program had 26 major changes while we were flying it. It's like you're building an airplane as you're flying it and the boss calls back and says, well, I think I like the paint, the, the plane painted pink. And everybody get out pink paint and start painting the plane on the outside. And then halfway through they go, maybe blue would be better or green. So expect change. Also the fact that in eight or 10 days, we'll have a new administration. 
we'll have new bosses. My boss has already been nominated. So we don't know what changes will come down or what Congress will ask us to do. And this does happen. Uh, I was processing loans for the disaster loan program last year. And uh, all of a sudden they came down and said, churches are eligible. And we're all sitting there going, churches are eligible? And yep. So we started, I've made loans to Baptist, uh, Baptist, Buddhist, Presbyterian. I did the full range of churches. Farmers. Farmers are something SBA has never done. And all of a sudden, Congress said, yes, they do. And so we were making loans to farmers. So it's something you have to recognize. There's going to be some frustration in the fact there's going to be changes. But one of the things that you have to keep in mind with this change is most businesses are eligible. And less than 500 employees, we will do this. And if you're in business before February 15, 2020, you're involved. But the thing that most customers get lost in and is the fact that this is the payroll protection program. The loan amount is to take your monthly payroll times two and a half. That's the loan amount on this program because the name of the program is the payroll protection or paycheck protection or whatever we're gonna call it. The intent is to allow people to have money to pay their employees so they can keep working and stay, keep the doors open. And there are exceptions, the number of exceptions. For instance, there are people in three restaurants under three corporate entities. They're allowed to apply three different times for each entity, as long as each entity has less than 300 employees. You know, there's plenty of people own five and six steakhouses, you know, of various size, shapes, and descriptions. Because the name of the program is to pay the employees. I know there was a lot of controversy uh, during the last time everybody was kind of uh, being ugly and saying, well, this company is strong. Well, the name of the program is to protect the employees, not the bosses. And so you have to keep that focused on the intent of the program is to help individual, individual companies pay their employees to keep them off the street. Because if you don't have employees, you can't be in operation. And so this is something everybody has to say focused on. Congress is gonna refocus us from time to time, but in the official application, it doesn't ask for your, uh, uh, how much you're gonna spend on your power and all this, it asks you one thing, what's your average monthly payroll times two and a half. And then during the forgiveness phase, you will have, it'd be a 60, 30, oops, uh, excuse me, a 60, 40 or 70, 30 split, depending on what it ends up being. And that will be the, the when it turns into a grant. What we're asking you to do is spend at least 60% of the money to cover payroll. And the rest you can spend on your rent, you can spend it on mortgage interest. Uh, it's a wide range of subjects, a very open end. But in for product, it, the idea is to give you enough money to keep your people working and enough money to cover other type of expenses. And that's something that is very key to the program. And no matter which portal you enter, the it's going to be that sort of thing. Now, one of the things that's different on this program than it was the last time is we're, if you did not get a PPP loan, you're first in line. That's basically what the idea was. There were people who missed the boat on the last time for any number of reasons. So we're gonna give them first bite, uh, first draw, excuse me. I uh, keep calling it first bite, but it's the first draw period. Also, we are allowing smaller banks to open up the portal first. Big banks, Bank of America, and they are not open yet, but they will be. But we're trying to give the smaller community banks first bite on this. So it, uh, if you're looking to apply today, uh, look to a smaller bank. But we were given a lot of money. I mean, it was like double stack of uh, money because one of the things on my briefings that I thought was interesting is one of our senior people said, you know, Right now, we have more assets under control than a Bank of America. We're going, oh, geez. Like I said, 2,000 employees. And we're controlling more assets than the big guys. They have more people in Charlotte than we've got in the whole country. So the 
the fact of the matter is we are uh, being stressed out just by how much we're having to do, but we are stretching this out with the banks. Uh, our partners are going to be the banks and each bank is going to be different. Uh, some people will go to one bank and say, man, I didn't get treated right. Well, then you start looking at the online guys because they are there to earn the fee. There's different strategies by different banks on what they're going to do. So be aware that the payroll protection program is going to have a, a wide range of impact. And the numbers that we show on the out last one show that most of the people who got it got less than $150,000 and there were millions. Now, one of the questions is who can't play? And this is off the application, by the way, uh, the formal application. Actually, most people will never see the formal application from the SBA because the portal will ask them questions. It's a, you know, what's your name? It's kind of like TurboTax. It asks you questions. And then it goes and fills in the blocks for the 1040. And that's one of the things that almost all of the uh, portals do that. Uh, and, they, they, and they're going to ask you a question. Gee, have you ever uh, not paid the loan back from the government? Well, guess what? If you've never uh been playing with our stuff and you're currently delinquent defaulted in the last seven years and called loss to the government it's going to be hard to justify giving you more and is the applicant or owner of the applicant owner of other businesses with common management i helped a guy this morning uh he has a grocery store he has two grocery stores each one is a separate corporation actually he'll apply as he'll apply twice because they're separate, but he does have competent, uh, common management. All we ask, list the businesses and tell what he's doing. Dan, I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, one person has asked, uh, I wanna make sure I understand the loan amount. If for example, the average monthly payroll is $1,000, is the eligible loan amount then $2,500? Yes. It's just that simple. That simple. All right. We're not that complex a bunch. Uh, most of us, we only got 10 fingers and that's as far as we could go. Thank you. So uh, be aware that, because I have customers who are overthinking these things. They're saying, well, where do I put this in? You don't. You take your average monthly income and that's it. Because that's what we're here to help, the payroll. And by the way, uh, if you've only got $1,000 a month, don't forget that the owner of the business is also generally an employee. So you might want to look and make sure that you got all the players on the field before you start adding up things. And the reason this is going to be strict, when we get to the back side of this on the forgiveness, that question is going to come up again. What did you spend the money on? Well, I spent the money. Uh, you had to spend 60% on payroll. Well, uh, and you're gonna to have to provide payroll records. We're gonna ask that question. So this is the time. And by the way, one of the places to get this information for small businesses, because I've had some people who were, they go, how do I get that information? Well, every quarter you file, you have to file with the IRS and pay off your taxes. You have to pay your withholding. Well, to pay your withholding, you had to know what the payroll was. That's a good place to get the information. And we are allowing people to use 2020 or 2019, uh, whichever suits them better. So there are, uh, we're giving a little more flexibility on this, but the fact of the matter, it is based on your payroll. If you didn't have any payroll, then probably you're not getting any money. What can I say? You should have paid the people. Uh, they're going to ask you questions. And this is, again is eligibility. One of the things that people get lost on, they look at the SBA and they forget we are not Father Christmas. We are the government and we have eligibility requirements and we require people to do things because we have an objective. And that objective, uh, for instance, to increase payroll. Uh, in this case, we're telling people in the app in eligibility that if you are uh, incarcerated at a felony, and subject to an indictment, you probably are not eligible. And if within the last five years, any felony. And this is something that's been in our books for forever. It used to be anything would kick you out. 
Now we're giving people at least five years on a felony, fraud, bribery, embezzlement. Uh, however, if you've been convicted, you're calling from a jail cell, you got one call and you called us, this would probably not be eligible. Also, we can't finance, we can't help people if your employees are overseas. Uh, and that there are people, and I deal with these folks, well, they got 10 employees in France. Those cannot be used in this program. One of the questions that's gonna come up, is your applicant, is the applicant a franchise? If so, is he listed in the franchise directory? Why is this important? Because uh, the franchise directory is a list of all the franchises that are approved by the SBA. The, all the documents that are generated when you do a franchise, if that franchise would like to have be eligible or SBA financing in the future, they have to go through our attorneys. And we have a procedure for somebody to review the, all the, dis, the disclosures that that franchise does. There are a lot of franchises that are not allowed to participate. For instance, the 7-Eleven, it's a franchise. However, they are allowed to participate in the PPP program, but no other type of financing because the, our attorneys have determined the control factor by the mothership is too much. So this is something that's gonna be asked. And in the PPP program, you need to look at the franchise. If y'all have trouble finding that, it's in our website but I can get you a copy of it. It's all it is is just a list of franchises in alphabetical order and giving the number. But when you're filling this out, it's gonna ask that for that number because whoever is reviewing this, this is gonna be critical. Now for PPP, most likely it won't be a problem. We're letting everybody play. But if you go to another loan program, this would come up again. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And for clients, uh, during the last turnaround on this, one of the things I noticed is a lot of people were not prepared to apply for the loan. I'm not sure what they thought we were going to ask, but they were not prepared to go to a bank and apply for a business loan. And I would say, no matter how you plan to enter the system, get your financial statements, your tax returns, your payroll records, expense sheets, uh, whatever you've got that can answer questions on your business and be prepared to respond to banks within a day. There are going to be millions of people. There, we're not talking just a couple million, we're talking tens of millions of people applying for a loan. Think of it as if you're waiting to get into a movie that's very popular and you've been waiting in line for two hours and you get up to the uh, counter and you suddenly realize you can't buy your ticket because you forgot your, uh, your wallet in the car. And you say, just a second, I'll go get my wallet. And you're gonna walk across the parking lot of the mall and get your card. Uh, the world will not wait for you. You just lost your place in line. You'll get to the back of the line. No one's gonna let you in be because you waited two hours. That doesn't count. And most lenders have a timeline. If you've got a bank that's got an application on you, it becomes less critical as time goes by have your stuff, go ahead and scan it, have it on your telephone if you need to. So when the banker calls you and says, we need your 2019 tax return, be prepared to email it to him instantly. Have your documents ready to go. Don't lose your place in line. That is critical in this program. When you hear people go, well, it took me weeks. Well, the time that in between you, the bank asking for something and you producing it, if it's a week, expect you're now gonna be three weeks in behind because of the simple reason uh, you're no longer a priority. There's other people have stepped up and there are people being taken care of. So the, maintain the uh, sense of urgency to get this done. Waiting and just kind of dillying, that won't do it. That's kind of mean, but that's the way it is. Now, this program is a little bit different than the last one because we've already had one. And the first draw, the first bite people, can use the money for everything we just talked about. Mortgage interest and all the other things, and worker protection cost. All of these are eligible use of proceeds. So you can expect that. The 
Second thing that's going to come out is the second draw. These are people who got a PPP loan on the last section. They're still eligible and they can come in. And some of these rules are going to be a little vague. And, you, and one of them is you should be able to demonstrate a revenue reduction of at least 25% in the uh, quarters of 2020 to 2019. That probably is not going to be that big a trick because not a whole lot of people can say their sales went up uh, from 2019 to 2020. But that makes that's part of the eligibility. Now, when someone says, well, that's not quite true for me, well, don't give up because of the simple reason that this is one of the rules that may change. And anytime we've got a rule here that's got a, uh, a number in it and it compares things, those are the ones that we can expect to have a change in. Somebody, is, somebody somewhere is going to change our mind for us and we'll change the rule. Like I said, in the first program, we had 26 of them. So, and we're on one now. So expect that to happen. And I, a change just came down this morning. I haven't read it yet. It's nine pages long. I scanned it and it didn't seem to be the type of thing that would affect what we're talking about, but it has to be something we're going to do. Also, other requirement, if you got money in the first deal and you haven't spent it all, you need to tell somebody. Although in all honesty, I don't think that's going to be that big a problem because we're in the forgiveness side, almost everybody. And the last loan is four or five months old. So everybody has spent the money. So this is not one that's going to be an issue, I don't think. But keep in mind that we're going to do that. Now, one of the programs that's still running, it's just extended to December, is the Economic Disaster Loan Program, the EIDL Loan Program. This is different. And actually, we need to kind of blow a whistle, take a, a break, and say, well, this is what's different about this? Well. Uh, it's a direct loan from the government. It's a 30 year term loan. The first year is deferred. It's basically unsecured. They just take a UCC filing. Uh, no, no guarantors are required. So you get the feeling if you go to the bank and ask for an unsecured loan for $150,000 at 3.75 and you don't want to sign any notes, they call security and lead you out. But here we're going to allow this because this is not a, a program to expand business. This is a lifeline. Your business is in trouble and you need some bucks. And this is the one where nonprofits are eligible. And uh, like I said, Congress changed our mind and said, make them to churches, whoever. So this is something that everybody is eligible for. The application is online. Go to sba.gov. There's a little banner across the top and it says EIDL loan or EIDL loan. Click on that and you're sitting at our application. I processed over 2,000 of these uh, last year. Uh, some of them I looked at for all of 20 seconds. These are, a lot of them are machine processed. We're going to look at your credit score. If it's in the range, we stop looking at credit scores anymore or problems. You hit the number, you're done. Uh, if you've got the, uh, you filled in the blanks correctly. And that was always been a problem. We had problems with people who were, didn't know where they were, what business they were in. They didn't know the name of their business, which was concern. But we had to work through it. And think of it as an insurance claim. Because people call up and say, man, I need the money to expand. No, this money is to take care of losses. And what we're asking you to demonstrate is the fact that you were damaged. That's why you had to be in business in 2020, prior or 2019. You had to be in business and 2020 had to be worse. Otherwise you weren't damaged. Uh, so that's what we're asking for. And uh, a lot of folks really are weak on accounting. And if you're giving advice, uh, when, this, when we say revenue, we mean sales, because the loan is based on your, not on your profit, it's based on your revenue. And we take your revenue minus COGS, if any. And some businesses need to be reminded that they're a cash business, they probably don't have COGS. A lot of businesses don't. If you're a manufacturer, probably do. If you're a grocery store, you have COGS. 
But if you were a coffee shop, for instance, it's unlikely you have cost of goods sold. Beginning inventory, ending inventory, you probably don't have that. So you need to be aware that we're going to have revenue minus COGS. Zero is an acceptable number for COGS. So if you have revenue minus COGS, you divide that by 12, multiply by six, that's the loan, by the way, that's your loan amount. That's it. It ain't real hard. We're not digging too deep into the world. We're not asking how much money you made, how much you lost. We're asking to have revenue and we're looking to in, uh, support your revenue so you can get through the next six months. If you're a nonprofit or a farm, we're gonna look at six months of expenses. That's it. We also do rental businesses, but you do, there's four questions at the end of this and on the application that you really have to pay close attention to because if you don't, you'll get declined. Now, what happens if you get declined? It's not the end of the world. You'll get a decline letter because you missed something. Gee, we weren't able to verify your income. And they will ask you for certain documents. One, we weren't able to establish the fact that you were in business. There are some people a little weak. Uh, you can't find them. I was doing Google searches on companies and uh, sometimes you had to actually go down on the street level and look in the window to see the guy. So we're actually going to be checking, does the business exist? Secondly, by the way, if you're a farm and you're located in New York City on Central Park, there's a good chance you're probably not a legitimate farmer. Uh, Dan, I had one. Yes. Dan, I've got a couple questions here. Okay. One says, what's, what is the formula for the EIDL loan amount? Uh, take your uh, revenue, divide by 12, multiply by six. Say it again. Uh, revenue, sales, minus COGS, that number, and this is on a for-profit operation, and uh, you divide by 12, multiply by six. All right, that's one of them. The that's second it. one, second question says, any EIDL advanced loan slash grant? Oh, okay, I was gonna to come to that next, but I'll cover it now. EIDL, the one we're talking about is the one in place right now. That's, and that's the first thing you gotta recognize. Congress has authorized a second one with, with, uh, with a grant on hook to it, $1,000 ahead. The rules have not been uh, written yet. Soon, but it has not been written yet. Uh, and we don't expect it for 30 days, which means it could come out tomorrow. Uh, I'm not hooked in tightly with the guys doing the writing, but they are actually putting this program together from scratch. Now, uh, a problem I saw when I was processing, uh, people would turn it over to our accountant and the accountant would sit there and fill out the first part and they had the number, right number of employees and they qualified for say three or $4,000. They got the grant, but they didn't finish the application, the revenue portion. And so they were declined. They got the grant, but they were declined for the loan because they didn't fill out the loan part. We turned it down. And then six months later, they realized I needed the money because they realized this thing was going longer. Uh, this, all of a sudden we can't help them anymore because they lied on their application, not lied or omitted. So they were turned down because they didn't have sufficient revenue. They, weren't pro they couldn't prove they were damaged. And it's hard to overcome that. Uh, so if you're going to apply with the new EIDL where the money is authorized, fill out the whole application. Say you will qualify for a maximum of 150, you get the 150,000 and they got the grant money. Well, what happens next? you're not required to take the money if you don't want it. But I do recommend you take it. Uh, and I have told people that take the money, put it in the bank. You've got a year to, you've got a year to think about it. That's when the first payment, you got $150,000 sitting in your checking account and you didn't quite need it yet, but you might. It's a lifeline, it's a life preserver. We don't know what's going to happen in this next little bit. We've obviously proven that because we're on round two of the 
economic disaster loans. So be aware that um, that it might not get better. It might get worse. So if you've got $150,000 sitting in the bank, it may be the life preserver you need to save your business. But a year from now, we're now sitting in January 2022, and everything's just peachy clean. We're all walking around uh, barefoot and happy. Well, make your first payment of $150,000, pay off the loan. What harm did you do? None, but you did preserve yourself. Second thing I recommend, and this I do with farmers. Um, I've helped a lot of farmers with this loan program and they would say, well, uh, what should I use the money for? Because they're not used to this type of money laying around. I said, go around and look, you have a tractor. Yes, you just financed it, how much? It's financed at 9%. Go figure, pay off the tractor. You now have one year of no payments and you reduced your interest rate on that item. Farmers are not real good at this, but this is something for farmers, nonprofits that allow them to do things. Now, at the bottom here, we talked about farms and nonprofits. The loan amount is based on expenses. You got a farmer, uh, he'll put revenue in, but we're going to base it on what were his six months of expenses. That And nonprofits, churches, churches don't have revenue or they may, but uh, we're basing this on their expenses, six months worth of expenses. The idea being keep the people working, pay for the rent, keep the lights on. So it's there. Dan, so, I've got three more questions when oh, you're ready. Okay. Uh, the first one is, is it expected that the IT loans will stay at 90% when a standard 7A goes up to 90%? Yes. Uh, because we don't know how long the 7A program will stay at 90%. And the second one is, are economic disaster loans forgivable or no. are there any prospects they might be? No. We've been making disaster loans. This was the first program I worked on uh, 40 some years ago. All right. And the third we one- are, and, so, and we never forgave anybody. We're still collecting on those loans. Okay, thank you. The third question is, is there any indication that with the increase in appropriations to cover fee reductions slash waivers and the 90% guarantee that EIDL loans may be applied against wave two of PPP loans? Would you mind saying that one again? Uh, I'm going to, maybe we can bring Mr. Kuttner online here. Let me see if I can bring... Mr. Kuttner, can you unmute or Ms. Kuttner? I don't know. M. Kuttner, can you unmute and ask your question again? I did, he added, I know that in the first wave of PPP, Initially, you would deduct the EIDL loan. Oh, that's, that's been done away with. That was a change. Okay. I guess that answers the question then. Yeah, that was one of the, it's way down in the, in the documents, but it's there. Uh, they did away with that. And also the tax, uh, everybody was talking about taxes and such. Well, that was done away with also. It's not, no longer, the IRS has been told to sit down and be quiet. Uh, so they don't get a share. Now, I'm going to shift gears. Uh, let's, talk about, let's go back to my J job. Small Business Administration years ago recognized that we needed players uh, to be able to export. If you needed a billion dollars, if you're a Ford Motor Company or General Motors or D John Deere, people would come running to loan you a million dollars or a billion dollars. However, if you needed a merely a million dollars or a hundred thousand, just 5,000 for a container of lumber. It was a little harder to get. So we've created some programs to help banks help customers. And first of all, we had to get some definitions. What is an export? Because that turned out to be a really hard one. Good ship from the U.S. and its territories, yes. Good sold to the U.S. military at a base overseas is not an export. That's just selling to the U.S. military. 
However, there is an exception where we're selling to the US military and it's being turned over to NATO. That we may still be getting the money from the US military, but the product ends up at NATO, a French unit. Services, services. That is one of the hardest things for banks to finance because you're guys drilling holes in the ground in, in East Africa. Yes, that's an export. A consultant service for a conference provide management advice to a customer in the UK. That is eligible, that's a service. What, and there, you see a blank there. I just deleted something, hotels. Uh, we, when we first started this, the, uh, our program, we were allowed hotels. Well, turns out that wasn't a good idea because everybody wanted to refinance a hotel. But in our programs, you're supposed to be increasing exports. And that didn't work out. The IT program was, there were people were trying to do wedding locations and things that really was hard to justify. They wrote clever things, but we've eliminated this from our repertoire. Uh, even gas stations, because there were people were trying to do gas stations in Maine that were across the street from Canada. And most of their business was Canadian. They would drive over and fill up. We decided that's really not what we were supposed to be doing either. That didn't really, help exports from the U.S. Logistical services to a Chinese company exporting to the U.S. Actually, I have done that loan where a Chinese company was bringing their product in and hiring an American company to box it up and sell it. The product, the title of the product never changed. Archive was actually selling a service to a Chinese company. That was an eligible transaction. And we did that deal. You've got uh, something that's U.S. designed and ordered, manufactured in China, and shipped directly to a buyer in Japan. No, we don't do drop shipments. That's one of the things we will not do, uh, because all we're doing there is providing manufacturing uh, finance support for a Chinese company, and that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Now, we have three programs, and I'm just going to hit highlights because of time constraints and the fact that uh, uh, I will be later as the year progresses, we'll be putting on a series of webinars. One, talking specifically about these programs, but I'll also be doing a series of webinars for customers for basic skills, how to use a letter of credit, how to do a quota price with a pro forma. Uh, we'll usually do these once a month. Uh, I usually do these with the SBTDC in North Carolina, and we'll put it on, and we do invite bankers to come in, uh, to sit in, and there's nothing wrong with you contributing uh, to, these, uh, to these discussions. Most of you guys do letters of credit every day. If I'm making a mistake, share it with me. Uh, pro forma invoice, what does a bank need? How to pick a bank. That is something, uh, we, uh, what, do, what do you have to have to go to the bank to borrow money? Because uh, I'm dealing with a lot of customers who are not uh, been in business for multiple years. So we need to be able to train bankers, uh, customers to bring you stuff that makes sense to you so that you can use one of these programs to help. So the programs we're going to talk about for the next 15 minutes, everybody's got to be a small business. And if a, if you've got a question about a size standard, call me because the first, the first line on every loan report that I do is, is the business and eligible small business. One of the things that on our programs, no US content requirement. Military sales are allowed. Uh, do a lot of military sales. I know some banks do not do military sales right now. It's not considered uh, cool, but uh, lots of small businesses do upgrades. All retired military guys got together and they're selling upgraded avionics for old Huey helicopters from Vietnam or fuel pumps for C 130s or even upgraded, uh, I think, American military rifles and sell them to police forces in India. And those guys all want the cool looking rifles with the little toys hanging off of them. There's guys here that do that kind of work and they sell it to the Indians. And it's very good because I don't think we've ever had a failure for getting paid on military. For some reason, everybody can pay for their guns and ammo. That seems to be something that's uh, across the board. Nobody orders machine guns unless they can pay for it. The Export Working Capital Program is my major program. This is the one I'm, I lead on. 
uh, I process these for non-PLP lenders. I give you a 90% guarantee, 5 million maximum. It can be a single project or revolver. We can do it as a transaction, pre-shipment, or asset-based, depending what's needed in the individual thing. Also, we can use this program for standby letters of credit. And this is for bid bonds, performance bonds, advanced payment guarantee. One of the most common things I see is a shipment going to China and sold on a letter of credit. Everybody was happy except on line three, it says uh, the, our guy has got to come up with 10% standby letter of credit. And the bank says, well, we can do that, but you got to put up the cash or uh, which that can be a million dollars on some deals. And the customer goes, uh, I got to come up with a million dollars, either that or in, because uh, it has to be collateralized for the bank. Well, we can do 90% of that. We can take away some of the risks for you and allow and lower that number down so it's something that the bank can use. I've done performance bonds where uh, the, the deal was $65 million, but the guy needed a cumulative standby letter of credit for $5 million. And the bank needed $5 million in cash to back it up. Well, the fact of the matter is, uh, with our guarantee on the standbys, they didn't need to have the money. They could take a little of this, a little of that, and pretty soon we were, the guy was able to make it because he honestly quite said, if I had $5 million in cash, I'd open my own bank and finance it. But that company had $65 million in sales that year. And they, matter of fact, uh, we can't loan them money anymore because they're too big. They outgrew us. So it's something that can be used. Indirect exports. This is something that nobody does hardly. We will finance indirect exports. We have bunches of major corporations, BMW and Spartanburg. Uh, you're making lug nuts. You're selling the BMW. BMW exported $5 billion worth of cars last year. And I'll bet you every one of them had lug nuts on them. So our guy couldn't get financing. Well, we can finance that. I have chemical companies that uh, make chemicals and make items for other companies. And you, I've had one call me and say, Dan, how do I prove that I'm exporting? Tell me the deal. Well, they send me an order. And on the order, it says after I make it, to turn it over to their freight forwarder in Charleston. That's evidence. That's more than happy. We, you've got to have something in your file that shows that the domestic customer is actually exporting somewhere. But it turns out that's not that hard to get. The EWCP program divides into two basic ideas, transaction-based and asset-based. Most of the deals I'm working on are transaction-based. They are self-liquidating, short-term. Uh, we require a first lien on offset assets being financed, inventory, work in progress, and the AR, assignment of proceeds under letters of credit, if any, credit insurance, and personal guarantees of 20% of all the players. Now, something that's just changed in October, to get an SBA loan, you have to be either a U.S. citizen or 50%, the 50% 50, 50 guys have to have a green card. That rule is now in place. It used to be I could work all kinds around that, and there were exceptions and ways of doing things. That has been taken away. They simplify that one rule by saying, dude, have a green card, be a U.S. citizen, and the managers have to be managing in this country. It can't be just a hollow item. Uh, and we always have to have at least a guarantor. Uh, that's true of all SBA loans. This is a hands-on program. Uh, if you're a banker, you would handle it like a construction loan. Matter of fact, I recommend to the banks, go down to the basement and get your construction loan officer, bring him up and make him an international guy. Uh, because you got a purchase order, you're gonna build a house, you build the house, you advance money till it's finished, then the mortgage sells, you get your money and pay off the construction loan. That is exactly what we're doing here. I think it used to be called a guided line. This program does not require borrowing based certificates. You don't have to have an international department and your customer provides the costing on the project. You start with the costing from the customer. He says, it's gonna cost, I got a project, I'm gonna build lug nuts for BMW. It costs a million, uh, pro I'm gonna sell them for a million dollars. It costs me $800,000 to produce them. Loan amounts, 800,000. Hey, that was easy. And the, uh, 
And when the money comes from BMW in Austria, it gets here and you tear off your 800,000 and give the customer his money. You have a controlled account where the money comes to the bank first. It's very similar to a construction loan. You always make sure you get first bite. And like I said, the milk and the cookies must be equal. Um, one of the things that will get you in trouble, we have a construction loan, we have that BMW deal and it's going, you get to the end of the year, it's time for renewal. And the question is, uh, there's no contract or the contract's completed and there's a balance. Where did the money go? This is the same one you would ask if when they're building houses and uh, they build all the houses and there's still something missing. Uh, if you've been a, if you ever worked as a construction officer, you understand this. All of a sudden there's money still not being paid, but all the houses are sold. That's an oopsie. It happens in the best of families, but we require a construction account and we would require y'all to service this. By the way, uh, one of the things about this program, there's no cap on interest rate. There's also no cap on servicing. This falls under extraordinary servicing. So if you create something to monitor this and you charge the guy for it, matter of fact, I don't know about how they do construction loans now, but when I did it, uh, this guy was allowed four free draws and after that, we whacked him for a couple hundred bucks every time he walked in the bank. So it, there is an ability to recover funds. We don't mean this is a charity operation. And we have express, oh, excuse me, asset-based loans. Asset-based is more advanced. Uh, this is a guy that's already been in business. He's got export inventory. He's got export uh, receivables. And what you're doing is he's been doing this and he's ready to expand, but he needs to be able to have a higher advance rate uh, that then the bank may be happy with. Y'all may be doing 70%. And he could, but just by increasing his advance rate, you allow him to have more money without more risk. And we allow y'all to do this. However, generally, unless the guy qualifies, and we'd have to negotiate this, we expect that you know, he would have either a, a, a export insurance policy or uh, he's dealing with a frontline company. He's in, he's in Germany, he's dealing with BMW. That one we could do 90%. It's not designed for first time sales. This is designed for normal operations. Also export inventory, we could get up to 75% advance on those lug nuts, that would be good. So it, it's, it provide, it's just more for a existing company. Uh, the average I see on these is about $3 million. So this is a little more advanced. Most of the smaller businesses I deal with, lumber exporters and the guys selling uh, lug nuts, it's going to be on a contract basis. So we're dealing with a, uh, a little more uh, control. The, uh, however, on the, the EWCP asset base, you would have borrowing base, you would have reconciliations and all the normal things you would have on a, a regular advance. Express. Dan, I noticed some people are signing off at the three o'clock. I want people to know that we're going to carry forward Oh, I've got, uh, oh, we sorry. have an audience and just want people who are not, we're going to finish the program here and answer questions if people have them. So please continue. Oh, I'm on my last slide. All right. Export Express is a program that was a, it was a pilot. It's now a full-time program and it's designed to help people export. It can be up to half million. Most of them, we give a 90% guarantee on loans up to 350. So that makes for, if your bank is doing smaller loans, uh, you got branches where the guy wants to do something where he's doing a, a very small deal. This provides the working capital uh, for this guy to export. And it can either be a line of credit, it can be a, a revolver, or it can be a single event. This has all the features of Express, except it has a 90% guarantee. and we, it's made to fit a smaller exporter because sometimes you've got, a, you've got a customer only tens of thousands, not millions. He needs to add a, buy a machine to help him export. He needs a machine that will print in metric or something. Uh, and I've had people do printing presses. They had to do, uh, they were exporting into Canada. They didn't need help exporting into Canada, but their printing press for their bags 
had to be in French and they had to order new plates. And that would turn out to be a little pricey. It's a tool that you can use to capture a customer who was sitting there and said, man, I need $100,000 to export uh, Timbuktu. And you want this customer in the bank. Well, instead of trying to give him a tea towel and a golf towel, you can actually give him something he can use. And you can take the rest of his business and you've got a reason to attach the customer and bring him into the bank now. You'd reel him in. This is the bait. So you're able to give the guy. You need a, He's got a building. He wants to add on to it. Uh, you can take a second mortgage. But the building, just by adding this uh, extension on, will not increase the appraised value. So he's now, you're out of, you're a little upside down. Use this program, take a second deed of trust and continue to march. This would give you an ability to add on to that building, take a second, have a 90% guarantee on that portion of the deal, which brings the uh, appraised value back into line. And, you know, our customer needs a line of, is growing export sale, needs to retool to support his new export line. It's a sawmill, it needs to upgrade his kiln. Kilns run about a quarter million a piece. He needs to add to his building. He needs to purchase inventory to support an export order. A chicken producer needs a new cooler to support his export trade into Mexico. Warehouse needs to upgrade and improve the store export supplies. It has to meet requirements down at the, uh, near the ocean. He needs working capital just to support it. He needs $50,000 permanent working capital to support what he needs, but he doesn't have adequate collateral or you've already got him tied up all the way. Well, 50,000 would not be that big a deal, but it could be what it would take to make the guy work. International trade loan. Yes, 90% guarantee. Seven A is gonna be have a 90% guarantee. I'm not sure how long. Uh, it may make my pro this part of my program uh, not something I can do or nobody will do it because gee, you're already getting a 90% guarantee. I can't address that issue at this point, but because uh, like I said, the laws keep being passed and uh, we're getting the stuff kind of slowly down here. But this would be something that you would use, assuming that when the change happens uh, and, it go, and regular loans go back to 75%, this offers you a chance to have that 90% for a company that is entering into a, uh, entering into a new market. And if you're a banker, this means secondary market. Uh, did you want a 75% guarantee to sell on the second dairy market or a 90% guarantee? Now, uh, like I said, this is a lick and a promise. Actually, normally I speak for an hour on each program and we get into the weeds, but it's unnecessary at this point. The idea is to introduce you to the programs and give you my name so you can call and ask questions. Ultimately, what my job is, is to be a consultant help and refer people. When a customer calls me and he says, man, I need a bank. I try to direct him to a banker that will, and I'm more of a banker person than a bank. Uh, you know, usually uh, I deal with a very narrow bunch. If I'm dealing with a larger bank that has bunches of people, I ask for who's the head, per, who's the guy I need to talk to. So when I refer people, I'm referring them to some same guy who may be passing it out to, to other parts. So we keep the uh, control mechanism at a minimal and we're not, uh, I don't have to remember as many people. I do show up for uh, training at banks on some days. I haven't done it in a while because of the simple reason it was, um, for the simple reason we can't get out and meet people uh, without sitting across in the parking lot and having a bullhorn. But I suspect that's gonna change soon. I think the sun's gonna come out in the spring and everybody's gonna be vaccinated and there's gonna be this urge to do more business. And uh, we'll be back to touching and shake. We we'll, won't be elbow shaking, we'll probably uh, shake hands. So if anything we can do to help, call. And if you wanna just talk about a deal, gee, I got this guy who wants to export used cars in Nigeria. That's not unusual. Or uh, uh, gee, I wanna to talk to about a guy that's exporting uh, machine parts to South Korea, which is a very good deal. Or we're entering the Chinese market. What do we need to do? And in some cases, you'll be, I will refer you to people uh, from various organizations such as the World Trade Association, 
I'll be talking to you to deck. And there are people who are actually in these markets. I mean, they're live there and they're not competitors and they're willing to share the information. They'll mentor you. So there's people out here that are willing to help. The SBTDC uh, is very active in this state and in South Carolina. So we will bring them to the table also. If you need somebody to do some analysis on your customer and he's an international customer and you need, and, and you just don't have time and manpower to be doing deep analysis and cash flows and such on this guy, SBTDC can do this for the guy. And I'll be glad to refer you to the uh, Mike Siebert where he'll refer him to one of his three major counselors. And they're very good at what they do. Uh, credit insurance, I'm a great supporter of credit insurance. I like to see companies protecting themselves like liability insurance for your car. Uh, we wanna protect the customers so we can keep them. Uh, but that's basically what I've got. Feel free to ask questions uh, if I haven't answered them. Uh, like I said, we started off with the Paycheck Protection Program, which is expect change. Matter of fact, uh, I just had a, a, up, a little thing click up on the end, said another notice was out. We might've changed everything already, but expect change over the next 10 days. I encourage people to put in as soon as possible, but not, but make sure I'm talking to customers. They should have their stuff together. You bet. That's one of the challenges of all the loan programs. Don't go see a banker with nothing in your hand. And I've always told people, if you go to the bank with nothing in your hand, you'll leave with the same thing. If you didn't bring your paperwork and the stuff the banker needs to do his job, boy, that was nice. You got to drink his, uh, you got a free bottle of water. But that's about all you got. You want to make that relationship with the banker. I am very uh, great believer that the customer has to be in the bank, no matter what. And I'm getting a lot of people calling and the problem they've got is, well, I don't have a bank. Why not? You've been in business for five years. You don't have a banker. Come now. What's wrong? Hey, thank you, Dan. I think you've done a great job with this presentation. The Carolina World Trade Association is especially proud to have you make this today. And uh, it's nice to find someone who really knows how these programs work and how the SBA views them and knows the ins and outs of them. I think you've given us a lot of pointers today that'll help folks be successful in any one of these directions. I'm gonna hold out here for just another moment. Are there any other questions out there that someone might have that we have not answered? Uh, I'd like to make sure I don't wanna overlook anyone in particular. Uh, please use the chat uh, button at the bottom to, to write one if you have one. And if not, I wanna tell you about one more item. Uh, the Carolina World Trade Association is a sponsor of the Certified Global Business Partnership uh, Certified Educational Program that's put on by the SBA Small Business uh, Development and Technology Centers and the National Association of, of uh, Small Business Educators. Uh, we're going to have a series of four training programs that will occur on each on the Wednesdays. Wednesday is January 20th, January 27th, February 3rd, and February 10th. They'll be from 10 a.m. to 11.30. Those uh, programs are listed on the invitation that you received or any of the other notices from CWTA. Uh, we'd like to really grow a stable of uh, thousands of people in the state who become certified global business professionals. It's a certification beyond your MBA that we think will enhance your career and help your company be even more successful. Uh, I'm going to hold out any other questions. Um, I think we're going to draw this to a close. Thank you very much for your participation today. Thanks, Dan Holt, for your expertise. We're happy you've recovered from COVID. We hope no one else gets it, and we hope everybody gets their vaccine very soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Talk to you again soon. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, John. Great program. Take care, Go Wayne. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.